Curvature is important because it encodes the physical degrees of freedom of gravity in the general theory of relativity. It is an intrinsic geometric property of a manifold. There's no need to imagine our space to be embedded in a higher dimensional space with respect to which it is curved, like we usually do when we imagine curved surfaces in three-dimensional space. Only intrinsic properties can be used to detect curvature and as we will see, it, curvature is related to the properties of parallel transport. And uh, that means that if we have a choice of an affine connection on our manifold, that also uh, results into uh, curvature related to it. We should also remember that in uh, general relativity, uh, the, the, choice, the choice of a metric from uh, solving the dynamics of general relativity gives us a preferred affine connection that is torsion-free and metric compatible. That affine connection will result to a curvature and this is the curvature that we consider to be uh, the one that is associated with uh, what we call gravity. But outside the general theory of relativity you can have curvature without having a metric like for example in uh, gauge theories. Curvature can be detected by looking at initially parallel uh, geodesics. In flat space, we know that parallel straight lines, the geodesics of flat space, remain parallel at all times. But this is not true anymore if uh, our space has curvature. Now, you see in these cartoons a very simple example of uh, curved two-dimensional surfaces where the straightest lines, the geodesics, start initially being parallel to each other, but if you have positive curvature, they are <coughs> getting closer to each other, and if you have negative cur curvature, they deviate away from each other. So, curvature has the effect to make initially parallel geodesics to deviate, but this deviation can, as we will see, uh, be measured by a, a relative acceleration. Uh, between the geodesics, like for example those little bugs, if they look at each other as they walk along uh, on their merry paths, uh, because of curvature they see that they are either approaching or getting away from each other. So there is a relative acceleration between uh, the two that uh, is the effect of the curvature of the manifold. Uh, this can be mistakenly perceived like a force by the ones that don't know very well about the geometry of their spaces and they can say that, uh, for example, in this po uh, positively curved uh, space that uh, as they move along they attract each other. So this is the idea of, uh, uh, the general idea of uh, 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 general relativity where instead of having a force describing gravity we have the geometry of uh, space-time. Another way to detect curvature is by parallel transporting a vector along a closed curve. In flat space, this is a trivial process. If, we, if you choose, like here, uh, a closed curve and you take a vector and you parallel transport it to itself along the curve, then after uh, you go around to the loop, you end up at the same point and uh, the vector is unchanged. This is not true anymore if you have curved space. Uh, a very popular example is to consider uh, the two-dimensional sphere, like in this cartoon here, and uh, then uh, the geodesics of uh, uh, this uh, sphere with the metric uh, uh, inherited by the metric uh, of uh, flat space, the so-called induced metric, is such that the greatest circles are geodesics. So, for example, the equator here is one of those geodesics, as uh, are those circles connecting uh, the south with the north pole. So, you can start from a point A and parallel transport a vector along such a geodesic that moves from the equator to the north pole, and uh, the result will be a vector that keeps constant angle with uh, its tangent vector. So, it will end up here, pointing in this direction. Then, as you move along this geodesic here, the 
vector will arrive at the point B, another different point on the equator, having the direction shown here. But then, when you parallel transport it along the equator from B to A, you will get back to A having the vector not pointing in the original direction, but rotated with respect to the first one by an angle alpha. So this angle of rotation is a measure of the curvature enclosed in uh, the surface that is uh, enclosed by the closed curve. Another example here is the cone. The cone can be thought of uh, as being uh, the two-dimensional plane where you have cut out an angle. And then uh, you take uh, those half lines here, this one and that one, you glue them together and this way you make a cone. So uh, with this construction we can keep the metric from the two-dimensional space where uh, if you use Cartesian coordinates uh, the expression is just dx squared plus dy squared as in ordinary R2. So let's say that you consider this closed curve here that starts from here, goes around and ends up at the same point because those two points are identified. So if you embed the cone in three dimensions it's like moving around on uh, this circle here. So with the metric that we have chosen the vector is parallel transported like it does on the plane, no change. But after you arrive here, there's nowhere else to go. That point here is the same as that point there. So you see that when the vector arrives here, it forms an angle phi with this line there. And because this line will be glued with this one, that means that this vector forms an angle phi with this direction, which is the original direction of uh, the vector that we started with. So the effect of transporting parallelly this vector around this closed curve is to rotate it by an angle phi. And you see that the larger the angle that we cut off, the larger is the deviation of that vector from uh, the original direction. So uh, you see here in an intuitive and descriptive way why this uh, change of the vector as it is a parallel transported along the cur curve, al around the closed curve, is proportional to the curvature of the manifold. So, as you see, uh, this process is intrinsic. We don't have any reference to the embedding. We only need to know how to parallel transport vectors. It is something that measures deviation from flatness. In flat space, as we, as we just uh, said, uh, parallel transport has no effect around the closed curve, but it does when curvature exists. However, it is very hard to write down expressions with uh, moving around uh, uh, finite uh, length closed curves. It is a global notion and uh, it's not easy to compute things. So what we really need is to make this notion local and describe everything in terms of tensors. So the idea is very simple, is to take those closed curves and shrink them to infinitesimal size. So again, let's be a little bit uh, uh, descriptive and not very formal. Let's consider two vectors, a vector w and a vector u and uh, you know some infinitesimal vectors constructed from those by multiplying them by the parameter here epsilon the real number epsilon so those two infinitesimal vectors form a closed curve this parallelogram and we can consider another vector v which is parallel transported in this counterclockwise direction along this curve so uh, when uh, this process will uh, finish, uh, the vector that will be parallel transported back to the point P will differ from the original one and we call this difference delta V. We will soon see that uh, this operation acts linearly on V. So the final result is uh, a linear map uh, from the vector V to the vectors in tangent space giving us this difference. 
We will also see that uh, this difference here depends linearly on the vectors w and u. So you see here we can save two slots to have linear action also, to describe also the linear action on, uh, uh, on w and u. And that will give us a tensor with four indices. Two indices here, uh, saving space for the vectors that we choose to construct the closed loop, and two indices there to describe the transformation that will take us from the old vector to the new vector delta v plus v. We already see that by exchanging the two vectors w and u that construct the closed curve, that reverses the uh, direction that we follow the closed curve. And that will give us the opposite change in the, uh, in the vector v. So we see that uh, if such a linear map exists, then it should be anti-symmetric with respect to the change of the last two slots. So, in order to quantify this difference, let's consider the directional derivative of the vector v along, let's say, one of them, the vector w. As we have already discussed in a previous video, this covariant derivative here me measures how much v changes along w relative to what it would have been if it were parallel transported. And uh, if we put here, uh, if we choose some coordinate system and we put here indices instead of uh, the choice of particular vectors, then w nu v, v rho describes the change of the vector v along the direction of the coordinate vector d nu. And if we act with two derivatives, that we see that at least, you know, we understand intuitively at, that, uh, at this point so far, that uh, by acting with the second derivative, this will describe the change along two segments of that curve. And if we see that by following the closed loop, we go in the opposite direction compared to the vectors w and u, we see that the, rel the relevant operation to describe the change is the commutator of the two derivatives, d mu and d nu. So first we have to act with d nu, then with d mu, and then subtract the effect of acting first with d mu and then with d nu. So we try this formal definition of what we mean by curvature. We write here a simple formula that is valid for torsion-free connections. And as we will soon see, uh, the action of the um, commutator of uh, two derivatives acting on a vector is a linear map acting on the vector v. And uh, that linear map is described by this 1, 3 tensor, which is called the Riemann tensor. By the commutator of the derivatives, we simply mean that uh, we subtract uh, the action of uh, the two derivatives uh, in uh, the two different orders that they can act on, uh, on an object. So, Let's look a little bit at the conventions and, uh, well, we have to be careful with those because they're, these are heavily author dependent and uh, when you look uh, uh, in the literature you have to make sure which convention each author chooses. That can uh, take uh, considerable time from your part. So the conventions that we follow are go as, go as this. So we have here the commutator of d mu and d nu, so the indices mu and nu going into the commutator become the last indices in uh, the Riemann tensor. Then the remaining two indices describe the transformation of the vector v to v rho. So you see that this is like a rotation. Uh, lambda acts here on this lambda and gives us rho that we find here on the left-hand side of the equation. So let's compute the action of the commutator on uh, this uh, vector v. Uh, we expand the definition of the commutator. Uh, there's nothing important done here. We just obtain 
those two second derivatives, mu and mu here, mu and mu there, reverse order. And uh, let's compute now the first term, d mu d mu v rho. So uh, let's consider the action of d mu on the 1, 1, 4 d mu v rho. So this is the uh, partial derivative of uh, the 1, 1 form, of the components of the 1, 1 form. And then we have two correction terms, one coming from the index downstairs, so this comes here with a minus sign, and the other coming from the correction for the upstairs index that comes here with a plus sign. Now, as you remember from the previous video, the index with respect to which we are differentiating, which is mu in our case, becomes the first downstairs index in the gamma symbol, Christopher symbol here, mu here, mu there. And then the index that we are correcting uh, goes uh, in the other slot uh, of uh, the uh, Christopher symbol here. So uh, we are correcting the new index, so new goes there. And then we have to sum over here uh, in the empty slots by choosing a dummy index lambda. Now, a similar term comes for correcting the uh, covariant index here, upstairs index. So this index is rho, goes here. Mu is the index of the derivative here. And lambda uh, is the contraction index for this term. Next. We expand the expression that gives the covariant derivative of v. Uh, here we just have one vector index, one upstairs index, so we just have two terms for those covariant derivatives. Just make sure that the indices are correct. The first one is derivative with respect to nu, and then is derivative with uh, uh, respect uh, to lambda, then it's derivative with respect to nu. So these are the three terms. The second terms here are multiplied by gammas. And then uh, we act with uh, the partial derivative on those two terms here, this one and that one. That's the second derivative for the first term. But then d has to be distributed on the two factors here, first acting on gamma and then acting on v. Now the uh, other two lines just have a simple algebra. And uh, then we need the term that has uh, the action of the derivatives in the opposite order. So we don't need to recompute. All we have to do is to exchange uh, the indices mu and nu in the expression that we have just uh, derived. So we see that um, the first line here as nu and mu, and the partial derivatives there, and then nu and mu comes here, nu and mu there, the opposite order, nu and mu here, nu and mu there. Now the second line here has nu and mu only in the downstairs indices of the Christoffel symbols, and then in the last one, we have to be a little bit more careful, we have uh, mu and mu here that have become new and new there and new and new here that have to become new and new there in order to compute the commutator we just have to subtract those two terms and we see that many cancellations occur first of all uh, the partial derivative is torsion free those two terms cancel out now this term here cancel with that term over there, and this term here with that term over there. Now you see those two terms that are uh, underlined with red color form those two terms there, and you see that they would have been absent in the case of uh, torsion-free uh, uh, connections. Now just for this lecture we will make some remarks of what happens if torsion is present and this is one of them. So you see here we have mu nu here, minus nu mu there, that will give us this common factor. And you see that the 
covariant derivative of v becomes a common factor in this uh, anti-symmetric uh, uh, part of the of the Christopher symbols. Now, uh, last but not uh, least, let's also uh, rename some of the indices in those expressions there. We have uh, v lambda that we want to take as a common factor for those four terms. So we rename v sigma to be v lambda. So the sigma index has to be uh, given a different name. It's a dumb index. We can give it any name we like. We rename it to lambda. But then uh, since lambda is summed over there, we also have to change this name and we change it back to sigma. So we have sigma, sigma there. Previously we had lambda, lambda. And uh, we have lambda, lambda there, whereas we had sigma and sigma there. So this is the expression we have for the action of the uh, commutator of the covariant derivative on V. Let's group terms in a convenient way. So the, there are terms that are acting linearly on V, and uh, these are the ones shown here. And there is a term that acts linearly on the derivative of V. And uh, we see that uh, the latter is uh, present only when the torsion is non-zero. If the torsion is zero, like uh, in ordinary general relativity, this term is absent. Now, let's look at this seemingly complicated term, which is not very complicated if we notice how indices are placed. So, first of all, you see we have nu and nu, which are the indices of the commutator. And, of course, you see that uh, the change of nu and nu changes the sign. So, all the expression here should be uh, antisymmetric with respect to this exchange. So, you see nu and nu comes here, and then nu and mu comes there, but with a different sign. So, this antisymmetry is obeyed by those two first terms. And then the uh, nonlinear gamma square terms over here have nu and nu there, and the second one has nu and mu there, and of course with the minus sign to have antisymmetry. The other indices, rho and lambda, you see we have the lambda here that has to become the rho on the left hand side, are the transformation indices of the vector. So you see for the first two terms there's no difficulty, there's only one place to put them over here, whereas in the quadratic term here, rho and lambda go uh, to the extremes, rho uh, over here and lambda over there, and uh, then we have one uh, index with respect to which we can uh, uh, sum over, a uh, dummy index, we call it sigma here, there's only one place to put it. So. If you pause a little bit and do it slowly, it is easy to memorize this expression that uh, will give us the components of the Riemann tensor. So, we define this parenthesis here to be the Riemann tensor, this 1, 3 tensor here, written in the first term. Now, again here, uh, we write the expression giving uh, the Riemann tensor in terms of the Christoffel symbols. And uh, you see how you can uh, write down this expression by placing the indices in, uh, in the right place. So this expression teaches us already some things. First of all, you see that if there is no torsion, so this term is absent here, you see that the action of the commutator of those of the covariant derivative of v gives something that acts linearly on v. So, uh, at each point of the manifold, the result depends only on the value of the vector field at that point, and not at its values in uh, in a small neighborhood around it. Uh, something that uh, would not have been true if uh, uh, derivatives of V uh, were appearing on the right-hand side. And uh, 
that means that if you have also two tensor fields, V and W, and consider the action of the commutator on them, then it could be completely different on a neighborhood of, uh, of the manifold, but if those tensor fields have the same value at one point, then uh, the value of the action of the commutator will be the same for both of them. In the presence of torsion, things are slightly different, and uh, there is dependence uh, coming from the first derivative here. But still, you see, it's much weaker than uh, naively expected, because you see the left-hand side here has two derivatives, but the right-hand side here has only one derivative. So, we see that the Riemann tensor is defined so that uh, uh, the Riemann tensor measures the change of V under the action of the commutator, uh, which is proportional to the values of V, whereas the torsion measures the change that is proportional to the derivative of V. Now, we already check that, uh, uh, as we discussed uh, in an informal way in the beginning, and uh, the way we expect it from the, its definition, stemming from the uh, anti-symmetry of the commutator here, the uh, Riemann tensor must be anti-symmetric with respect to its last two indices there. And if you inspect this expression here, you will see that indeed it is anti-symmetric under the exchange of those indices. Now, this expression here is valid for any connection that uh, uh, you, uh, you can choose on the, on the manifold. And also, we can write more general expressions if, uh, instead of choosing uh, the partial derivative here, we choose a globally defined fiducial uh, connection, d tilde, uh, then we obtain the very same expression, except that instead of uh, having uh, the gammas here, we have the symbols C that we defined in the previous lecture. So let's look a little bit more of why the action of the commutator on a vector depends only on the values of V when uh, the connection is torsion-free. In order to show that, let's prove an identity that uh, tells us that when the commutator acts on a vector field multiplied by a function, the result is the same as the function multiplying the action of the commutator on the vector V. So this is just algebra, but let's do it. Uh, first, we act with the inner derivative on the product, apply the Leibniz rule, will give us d f v uh, plus f d v here, and then uh, we apply the uh, second derivative d mu. We have uh, uh, two uh, factors here on which we act uh, separately with the derivative, again the Leibniz rule, and we obtain uh, d d f v plus d f d v. And then this acting on the second term will give us df dv plus f ddv. To form the commutator, we have to write the expression with the order of the derivatives uh, written down in the reverse order. And all we have to do is take this expression and exchange the roles of uh, mi and ni. So you see this is very easily done here. We just uh, uh, swap the two values, mi becomes ni, ni becomes mi, for all those terms. And when uh, we subtract, many cancellations occur. The first cancellation here is non-trivial, and comes from the assumption that uh, the connection is torsion-free. That's the definition of a torsion-free uh, connection. And then the other terms, you see that they cancel trivially uh, in the way shown here. So all that remains in the end is f multiplying the action of the commutator on v. And uh, this can help us to show the locality of this action, the same way we did uh, 
for the uh, connection in a previous uh, video. If we consider two tensor fields, two vector fields in our case, B mu W mu, such that their value coincides at the chosen point P, uh, then we will show that uh, uh, the result of the commutator acting on them uh, is the same at that point. So, if, we, if you consider the value of the difference between W and V in a neighborhood of the point P, then this will be a linear combination of some chosen bases, and uh, the coefficients here will give us functions in that neighborhood. Now, because W and V coincide at the point P, those functions will be such that they vanish when they are evaluated at the point P, but not necessarily uh, in other points, at other points. So, let's act with uh, the commutator on the difference of those two vectors. So that is the same as acting on this linear combination there. And by applying the trivial linear property with respect to the addition uh, of the commutator here, we arrive to this equation. And now we use the result that we proved in uh, uh, the previous transparencies here, equation 1, to uh, bring f uh, before the commutator there. So the value of the left-hand side at the point P will be the value of the right-hand side at the point P. So uh, all we have to do here is... Uh, put the values of uh, the functions f at p and the values of the uh, those uh, 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 those fields here at the point p but the latter ones are irrelevant because the functions vanish at the point p so the right hand side vanishes and if the right hand side vanishes it means that uh, uh, the commutator acting on W at P is the same as the commutator acting on V at the point P. So as a fun exercise, uh, do the same thing in the case where uh, the torsion is not vanishing to see what you get. So let's move on from vectors to higher rank uh, tensor fields. And the first step is to consider the action of the commutator on uh, one form fields. In order to compute that, we will follow a procedure which is similar to what we did for the uh, connection. So we consider the contraction of the one form field with an arbitrary uh, vector field v mu here, and uh, then we form the action of the commutator on that contraction. But the contraction is a function. So uh, we know that from the definition of the uh, torsion uh, uh, tensor, uh, this should be equal to the right-hand side. So uh, here we have the partial derivative acting on the contraction, but for functions the action of the partial derivative and the covariant derivative is the same, so we can replace the partial derivative with the covariant derivative. So the right-hand side is equal to uh, those two terms, so we apply the Leibniz rule, so d acts first on omega, and then it acts on v. And uh, the left-hand side is uh, uh, given by uh, computing d mu d nu, acting on uh, this function, and then subtracting the, this operator in uh, reverse order. So the first thing that we do is we act with uh, the inner derivative on this uh, contraction, giving us those two terms, d acting on omega and then d acting on v. And then we apply the second derivative, so each term here will give us two terms. First d is acting on d omega, so we have d d omega times v, and then d acts on v, so we have d omega dv. And similarly, for the second term, we have d omega dv plus
פלאס אומגה די די וי. Now we form uh, the same expression by exchanging the order of uh, the derivatives here. So all we have to do is take the result and uh, exchange mu for nu and form this expression here. And uh, when we subtract them to form the commutator on the left hand side, we see that the commutator is formed both for the first term, giving us the commutator acting on omega times lambda, and for the last term, which is omega times the commutator acting on v. Now the cross terms here cancel out, and that is very important, because if they didn't, then uh, it wouldn't have been nice. But they do, the reason is geometry, of course, behind that, and uh, we end up with only uh, those two terms on uh, the right-hand side. So what have we gained? Uh, the left-hand side is known, it has been uh, compu computed here, is this one, and then uh, on the left-hand side we have one term that has the quantity that we want to compute, and then the second term here has a quantity that uh, we have already computed and we can substitute for it. So the result is uh, uh, this here, where we have substituted the action of the commutator on V. We have one term here, that is the uh, uh, Riemann tensor, the change proportional to V. And then we have the torsion term, which is uh, this one there. So when we equate the right-hand side and the left-hand side, you see that th those two terms cancel. So we end up with uh, this term here. And uh, on the right-hand side, we are left with this term there. Now, to arrive uh, at this expression, we have to take uh, V lambda as a common factor. So we have done some index renaming here. So we have renamed sigma to be lambda, so that we can take uh, V lambda as a common factor. And lambda has been renamed to sigma. So you see lambda here is sigma, and lambda there is sigma now. So this is the final expression that tells us how the commutator acts on one forms. We have a term that is proportional to omega, given by the Riemann tensor, and the term that is proportional to the first derivative of omega, which is given by the torsion. So this is quite similar to the result that we have obtained for vectors, except that we have a different sign there, and uh, the indices have to be placed in a different way to ex express the fact that now we are transforming a one form instead of, uh, of a vector. So you see, the indices nu and nu here are the same. They are the last ones, as in the case for vectors. This does not change. But now the indices here have to be placed so that they express the transformation of omega sigma into omega lambda. So lambda here must be matched with the lambda there, and uh, the dummy index here will give us the action of r on omega. So we can guess now what uh, will be the action of the commutator on a high rank on a high rank tensor. So if we consider tensor field of type KL, like the tensor field S here that has K upstairs indices and L downstairs indices, then uh, the action of the commutator here is uh, similar to the expressions that we. Uh, derived before for vectors and one forms. The first term is the torsion dependent term for connections that are not torsion free. And uh, this term is, as we said, uh, absent in uh, uh, classical general uh, relativity. And then uh, we have terms that are uh, uh, 
transforming each index of the tensor, a series of terms involving the indices that are covariant, they are upstairs, and a series of terms that involve the indices that are downstairs, contravariant indices. So for the uh, first line, sorry, for the second line here, we correct each one of the upper indices, taking the one after the other. Here's the first one, we uh, take a new one here. So a uh, new one will go at this position for the Riemann tensor, and then lambda will be summed over with the index there. So that is again like a transformation rule for this index. Now the remaining, the remaining indices, rho and sigma, are the ones that are found here in the commutator, and the rest of the indices of the tensor are uh, left untouched. So we repeat that for every index upstairs like until the last one, shown here. So that's the last index, mu kappa. And uh, the, all the indices are, are placed in a similar way. Then uh, we take the indices downstairs, starting from the first one, new one here. So new one must be placed here so that uh, it agrees with new one found on the left hand side. And then we sum over with uh, the upstairs index of the Riemann tensor with uh, the chosen index. And then we repeat that with every index downstairs until the last one here, that is new L, new L here, matched with new L there. And then lambda is uh, summed over, it's a dumb index. So the Riemann tensor is a 1-3 tensor. It has four indices, each one taking uh, n values, where n is the dimension of the manifold. So naively, uh, the Riemann tensor has n to the fourth components, but uh, as we have already seen, there are symmetries uh, with respect to uh, exchange of some of the indices of the Riemann tensor. Therefore, not all those components are independent. So we have to discuss what are the symmetries of uh, the Riemann tensor and then try to see how many independent components uh, that tensor has. So the first symmetry that we have already discussed and proved is the anti-symmetry with respect to the uh, last two indices found here, mu and nu. So if you exchange the order of those two indices, you obtain a minus sign there. And that is a property that is true for any uh, connection that uh, you can use to define curvature. Now, if you have a torsion-free connection, then there is another symmetry with respect to the indices downstairs. And it tells us that the anti-symmetric part, with uh, the anti-symmetry taking with respect to the indis indices downstairs, is equal to zero. And because we only have three indices, this translates to having the sum of three terms, where this index, of course, uh, is fixed. But then the other three indices are placed in a cyclic uh, way, permuted in a cyclic way, in uh, the, th the three possible uh, ways here. That gives us those three terms adding to zero. So you see, we have sigma min mi. And then the second term, we place sigma in the second slot, sigma min mi. And then we place sigma in the third slot, sigma min mi. In a cyclic way, you see, we always go in the positive direction here between those three indices. We have discussed this extensively in a previous video where we saw uh, symmetry and anti-symmetry uh, and permutations of indices. So now, if we add uh, another requirement that uh, uh, the connection is also metric compatible and torsion free, then we can define <coughs> uh, the tensor uh, R with all indices downstairs. That means we lower the index upstairs using the metric then this newly formed tensor, which we will also call the Riemann tensor, has an extra anti-symmetry 
with respect to the first two indices. So if you exchange the order of rho and sigma here, and uh, you obtain your minus sign there. Furthermore, there is uh, another symmetry uh, by exchanging pairs of indices now. So if you consider the uh, four indices in pairs of two, then you can move around the pairs and uh, the result will be uh, will give you back the same result, no minus sign involved. And uh, uh, in that case also, uh, the property that uh, we discussed here, which is the anti-symmetric part of the downstairs indices being equal to zero, uh, when this index can be brought down here is equivalent, sorry, not equivalent, but implies that uh, the anti-symmetric part of all four indices is equal to zero as well. So if you apply all those symmetries, which we will uh, uh, prove uh, at the end of this video, you will end up with only n squared times n squared minus 1 by 12 independent components. <coughs> and that in, uh, special in, uh, in the special case where we have two-dimensional uh, manifolds, gives us only one independent component. So curvature on two-dimensional surfaces is described by just one number per point. And that is why in uh, this uh, differential geometry we, we talk about the curvature of the surface. Notice also that for n equal 1 we don't have a uh, non-trivial uh, Riemann tensor. So any one-dimensional curve has no intrinsic notion of uh, curvature. It, can, it cannot be curved in an intrinsic way. Three-dimensional surfaces have uh, more structure in the curvature with six independent components and uh, the four-dimensional uh, manifolds have uh, 20. One more relation which is very important involves the derivatives of the uh, Riemann tensor and can be written in an economical way by stating that uh, d rho uh, with the first three indices uh, anti-symmetrized must be equal to zero. Now these are again only three indices, so this uh, equation here has only three independent terms, which can be written easily uh, by again writing uh, uh, the first three indices in a cyclic way. So we, we, we write those three terms, d rho, placing mi and mi fixed, on the last slots, and then we take uh, the indices to be anti-symmetrized, lambda rho sigma, and we put them in a cyclic order. So it's lambda rho sigma, then we put lambda here, second slot, lambda rho sigma, and then lambda rho sigma, by moving always in the positively, in the, in the positive uh, cyclic uh, direction. So this relation is different than uh, the symmetries exp uh, expressed in uh, this simple algebraic uh, form and uh, it constrains the relative values of the Riemann tensor at uh, neighboring points. The Riemann tensor has four indices, so one can in principle form many contractions of those, especially if one can use the metrics to raise and lower indices. So uh, uh, let's now discuss only Christoffel connections, that means metric compatible and torsion free uh, connections. So uh, we have seen that the uh, Riemann tensor has all those uh, nice symmetries, so we can form many contractions, but not all of them will be independent. So the one that has uh, two indices and uh, is important is the Ricci tensor. And this is formed by contracting the index upstairs with the middle index there. And that will give us a two index object. And uh, you can see from the other symmetries of the Riemann tensor that it is a symmetric uh, uh, zero to tensor. 
if we further contract those two indices, uh, using here the inverse metric, we obtain a scalar which is called the Ricci scalar or the Ricci curvature scalar. Another tensor that is important is obtained from the Riemann tensor after we subtract all its dependence on the Ricci tensor and scalar. So this is the, uh, the equation that defines the Weyl tensor, which has this property. So you see, this is the Riemann tensor with those two families of terms, the first one involving the Ricci tensor here, and the last one involving the Ricci scalar. So if you do uh, the subtraction in uh, this uh, way, where n is the dimension of uh, the manifold, then the Weyl tensor ends up with a bunch of very useful properties. First of all, the trivial ones, the symmetries of the Riemann tensor uh, remain, so we have an anti-symmetry with respect to exchanging those two pairs of indices, uh, symmetry with uh, respect to exchanging pairs of indices, uh, the anti-symmetric part here is zero, and uh, um, then uh, we can see that uh, the number of in the independent components of this tensor is given by the number of the components of the independent components of the Riemann tensor minus n times n plus one divided by two, and uh, uh, we can immediately immediately see that. Uh, uh, for n less or equal than 3, there are no independent components and the uh, Weyl tensor is uh, uh, trivially equal to 0 for 3 and less uh, dimensional manifolds. For n equal 4 and above, then uh, the Weyl tensor has non-trivial uh, content and uh, in the particular case of interest, n equal 4, we have uh, 10 independent components. The first thing to note about the Weyl tensor is that it contains the propagating degrees of freedom of gravity in the vacuum. In order to, to see this, we have to jump a little bit ahead and mention that uh, uh, the Einstein equations in the vacuum simply state that the Ricci scalar is zero everywhere. Of course, that does not mean that the space is not curved because uh, uh, the Riemann tensor has uh, more degrees of freedom than the ones encoded in the, the Ricci tensor. And these are precisely the ones that are encoded in the Weyl tensor. So when r is equal to zero, then the uh, degrees, non-trivial degrees of freedom of gravity are contained in the Weyl tensor. And uh, uh, the Weyl tensor has also another important uh, property if we perform a conformal transformation, which means uh, take your metric and uh, transform it to one that is multiplied by the same positive factor at all points, sorry, by a, fu by a positive function, not, uh, not the same value at all points. So by if you multiply it by a positive function uh, at all points of space-time, this will give you uh, the new metric obtained by the conformal transformation. Then you can show that uh, the Weyl tensor remains invariant. Another important tensor formed by contractions of the Riemann tensor is the, the Einstein tensor. The Einstein tensor is given by this expression here involving uh, the Ricci tensor here and the Ricci scalar there. Now in uh, four dimensions it simply changes uh, one can think that it simply changes the trace of the Ricci scalar, but uh, this is not something uh, general or very useful to, to think about uh, the Einstein tensor. Uh, the most important property of the Einstein tensor is that uh, if you take the covariant derivative of the Einstein tensor and then contract uh, one of its indices, it is symmetric, so it doesn't matter which one you contract, then uh, the result is uh, identically equal to zero. 
and uh, this is a direct result of the Bianchi identities. And this is uh, very important because in uh, gravity we want to uh, uh, quantify the effect of the presence of matter on the geometry. And uh, uh, the simplest way to express uh, matter in a covariant way is to use the stress energy tensor. So in Einstein's equation, the effect of the matter is described by the stress energy tensor of the matter fields, and we have to put something on the left hand side. But uh, uh, all known matter uh, that uh, we have in the universe has stress energy tensor whose uh, uh, d mu d mu nu is equal to zero. But uh, for this uh, equation here to be true, then also the left hand side must satisfy this equation. And uh, uh, the only tensor that can be, uh, uh, the simplest tensor that one can write down from the Riemann tensor that satisfies this equation is precisely the Einstein tensor. So, uh, we will soon see that the Bianchi identities imply that uh, uh, this derivative of the Ricci tensor, contracted here with mu and mu, is equal to one half the derivative of the Ricci scalar. So, the first conclusion of this result is that uh, the, the Ricci tensor cannot be used in uh, Einstein's equations in the presence of matter because it is not. Uh, uh, divergent free. But the Einstein tensor, Einstein tensor is, as you can see by substituting this result, therefore uh, the Einstein tensor is the right tensor to use in the dynamics of gravity. So let's see how this property uh, arises. Let's write down uh, the Bianchi identities. We have three terms here, having the derivative of uh, uh, the Riemann tensor. The last two indices are fixed. We fix them to mu nu. And then we take three indices and uh, we place them in a cyclic way in the remaining three slots. So we have lambda rho sigma. Then we put lambda in the second slot. And again, lambda rho sigma in a cyclic way. And then lambda rho sigma. Uh, with lambda in the third slot will give us the last term and uh, their addition should be equal to zero. So take this identity and uh, make contractions with uh, the inverse metric in this way. We multiply by uh, g nu sigma g mi lambda and now we use the um, uh, property that we have uh, asked the connection to have, which is metric compatibility. So using metric compatibility, we can uh, uh, take G and put it uh, inside the derivative here, because G is uh, covariantly constant, and do the same thing with uh, the other terms there. So let's look at the first term. The uh, Jemi lambda action of the metric has the effect of raising the lambda index here in the derivative, whereas the J nu sigma term has the effect of contracting the sigma index there and the nu index there. So in order to uh, to do this, uh, we have uh, to uh, rearrange the indices using the symmetries of the tensor, Ricci tensor, a little bit. So we have rho sigma mi ni. So we write that as sigma rho ni mi. So we uh, changed both the orders of the first and last two indices. Two minus signs will give us a plus sign. And then by uh, contracting with uh, g ni sigma, we contract this index with that index, which is what precisely gives the uh, Ricci tensor rho 
R or Omi. Similarly, we work with the second term. Uh, this uh, inverse metric here raises the index sigma and make it G new upstairs. And then here, in a similar way, we obtain uh, the rigid tensor there. Now for the last term, uh, both uh, factors of the metric enter inside the derivative. So first we raise the index using j nu sigma. So sigma downstairs here will become nu upstairs there. And then we change the order of the last two indices. We take nu nu here and we make it nu nu. And of course we have to put a minus sign there. Okay, that's a symmetry property of the Riemann tensor. So uh, in that case, we will obtain here the richest color, R lambda mi, and we contract it with J mi lambda, which will give us the richest color R here. So we have to be careful here in order not to miss this uh, minus sign. So this is what we are left over with. So the first two terms are the same, just by renaming the dummy indices. The last one has the derivative of the richest color. So the left-hand side is 0, 2 times the derivative of the Ricci tensor minus the derivative of the richest color equal to 0. That will give us the uh, equation that we used uh, before. So now let's compute the change of a vector as it is parallel transported along an infinitesimal closed curve and see how this is related to the curvature of a surface enclosed by that curve. So we start by considering an infinitesimally small two-dimensional surface <coughs> and choose a set of coordinates T and S where the origin is uh, taken to be here at the point P. And let T and S be the respective coordinate vectors. So let's consider a closed curve formed along integral curves of uh, the vectors T and S. So we start from P, then uh, we move along the direction of T to a point that uh, has components 0, delta t, then along an int integral curve of s to a point that has uh, coordinates delta t, delta s, then to 0, delta s, and then back to 0, 0. Then take a vector v and parallel transport it along that curve. So v starts from here. It is parallel transported along this segment of the closed curve. It arrives here at the point delta t0. Then it is parallel transported along here, there, and there. And then in the end, it arrives at the original point uh, being a different vector. So delta v is the change of uh, that parallel transported uh, vector along that uh, uh, infinitesimal curve. In order to compute this change, let's measure it with respect to a fixed one-form field. So we choose a one-form field that uh, has values everywhere on that surface, <coughs> and by that we mean that uh, uh, each point here, on each point here, omega has uh, a specific value. It doesn't. Uh, there's nothing to do with the parallel transportation of uh, of the vector v. So, uh, when we consider the change of the contraction of omega with v, then uh, this will be given only by the change in v, because omega will not be different when we arrive back at the same point. It will, it will be the value of the one-form field at that point. 
let's remember <coughs> some an elementary fact from uh, analysis if we have uh, any real function f <coughs> then uh, uh, we can express its value at a point t plus epsilon uh, compared to a value that is at uh, midway between t plus epsilon and t that means the point t plus epsilon over 2 and uh, this is given by a Taylor series around the point t plus epsilon uh, and is given by this expression here we ignore terms of order epsilon cube and above and uh, we can also express the beginning of the interval t t plus epsilon uh, as uh, uh, and, and compare it to values of the functions and of the function and its derivatives again at the midpoint t plus epsilon over two. So we will have a <coughs> symmetric expression, except that all the terms that are of odd powers of epsilon will come here with an opposite sign. So if we want to compare the value of the function at t plus epsilon to that at uh, uh, at uh, the value t, then this will be given by the first derivative, of course. But if we take the first derivative to be exactly uh, midway between t and t plus epsilon, then the terms that we are ignoring are of uh, order epsilon cube. And the reason being that uh, with this particular choice, the epsilon square terms drop out. They're not... Uh, affecting the accuracy of the result. So we will apply that for, for the contraction of omega with v, which is also a function on the curve. So if we start from the point 0, 0, and uh, we move along in the t direction to the point uh, delta t0, then the change of that contraction will be given by the derivative of that function. And if we choose the value of that derivative uh, at uh, the middle of uh, this uh, uh, zero delta t interval, then we will have uh, accuracy of uh, third order in delta t. Then we do the same thing, computing the change of that contraction along this segment of the closed curve, moving at uh, <coughs> a t, con t equal constant curve from s equals 0 to s equal delta s. Now we move from this point to that point, and uh, now we move in the opposite direction, so we obtain a similar expression as for the change on the first segment of the curve, except that now we have to put a minus sign, and uh, the derivative is evaluated uh, at uh, this point here with uh, coordinates delta t over 2 delta s. And the final segment of the curve here is uh, such that we are moving in the opposite direction compared to the uh, direction defined by the uh, coordinate vector s. And uh, then uh, this is expressed in terms of the derivative of the contraction uh, at this point found uh, midway between uh, this point and that point. Now you see, for all those <coughs> changes that we computed, we have to consider the derivative of the contraction with respect to the parameter that changes along the respective segment of the curve, but uh, since this is an ordinary function, we can replace the partial derivative with the covariant derivative, so we have that this is equal to t nu grad nu times uh, the contraction. And then we apply Leibniz rule, and uh, the covariant derivative first acts on v, and then acts on omega, but then use our construction where uh, v is parallel transported along any segment of that curve. Therefore, uh, it satisfies, 
sorry, it is left covariantly constant by the uh, t covariant derivative, and this term is equal to zero. So uh, this partial derivative here is equal to this expression there. So we substitute this result for the change delta 1 and the change delta 3. So this is the substitution that we have just made. And then we repeat the same reasoning on uh, the segments of the curve where s is varied. So we have the partial derivative with respect to s that is given by the uh, covariant derivative in the direction of s. And uh, we also substitute this expression here and there. Now, to compute the total change, we have to add equations 1 through 4. And uh, <coughs> we, group, we group them uh, by taking the segments that move along uh, the uh, integral lines of the same coordinate vector. And then we have the parameter delta t and delta s here to be a common factor. And uh, in the parentheses, you see that we have functions on the curve. You see there are no free indices. So these are contractions that will give us a function on the curve. And uh, <coughs> they both have uh, uh, they both equal to the change of that function along uh, the motion of the two different curves. So uh, the first term here has uh, this function here evaluated at this point compared to the uh, value of the function evaluated at that point. So it is this one minus this one will give us the derivative of that function for those two points there. And uh, this here compares the function at uh, this point to the value of the function at that point. So this will give us again a derivative uh, with uh, varying only uh, the t part of the function. So let's consider first the first line. So <coughs> the expression inside the parentheses has the value of this function here for s equals 0 <coughs> and that function there for s equal to delta s. So by applying the formula for the difference of the function at two different points we have here a minus sign because we go from 0 to delta s so that is minus delta s here then the derivative of that function, d by ds of the function, and this, for better accuracy, is evaluated at the midpoint, which is delta t over 2, delta s over 2. It's the point with coordinates, delta t over 2, delta s over 2. So, again, we substitute the partial derivative with the covariant derivative along S. And we do the same thing for the second line. So now we compare the values of uh, the value of uh, this function here for delta T and zero. So that will give us the derivative uh, times delta t, so the, the, f the largest one is first one, the smallest one is second, so there is a plus sign here, delta t. Then this is the derivative with respect to t, and uh, that function here evaluated at the midpoint. And you see that the two midpoints here coincide, and uh, we have now two quantities, uh, this one here and uh, that one there, that are to be compared at the same point, and that is uh, also important. So uh, this difference here, delta 1 plus 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 delta 4, is the change uh, of the contraction omega v 
along uh, uh, as we parallel transport V along the closed curve here and has uh, those two terms they both involve the product delta T times delta S but now you see that we compare this term and that term at the same point this point here so let's compute each term here one after the other we start with the first one so we have the derivative uh, acting on uh, a term that has three factors Leibniz rule will give us three terms the first one acts on V the second one acts on S and the third one acts on D omega now the first term is uh, vanishing because V is parallel transported along the curve so uh, its directional derivative along T is equal to zero similarly we work with the second term again we have three terms with the derivative acting on each factor here uh, dv dt uh, dd omega <coughs> and again the first term here is vanishing because of the uh, parallel transport of v along s now we will use that uh, tns defines a coordinate system and that means that uh, the two vector fields TNS uh, commute and uh, we have shown that the commutator is equal to this expression here on the left hand side who, which should now vanish and that means that when we subtract those two terms this term and that term cancel each other because you see we have T DS and here we have S dt and their difference is equal to zero because of this uh, equation now uh, we further manipulate the second uh, term here by renaming some indices we want to have the product of those three vectors to be a common factor in the final expression and we can achieve this by renaming uh, rho to new so s rho will become s new and new to rho so d new will become t rho but then we have to re rename also those indices here and d rho d ni will now become d ni d rho so now you see this uh, those factors here are common but now we, as we subtract those two terms we will obtain the commutator of the uh, two derivatives acting on omega so the total change of the contraction is delta t delta s the product of those two vectors and then the commutator of the derivatives acting on omega and remember that this quantity can be meaningfully computed because everything is computed at the same point here but we have already computed the action of the commutator of the derivatives on a one form it is given by the Riemann tensor <coughs> now we have to be careful with the indices rho and ni are the indices in the commutator they are placed here as the last two slots of the Riemann tensor and then uh, lambda and mi transform uh, omega lambda to omega mi so now we remember that the change of the contraction is given simply by the change in v because omega does not change at the same point we have assumed that this is a one form field that has a unique value at uh, the point P and uh, the right hand side is what we have uh, just computed we just put it here like that
and uh, uh, we rename the indices a little bit and the reason for that is because we have to uh, we want to have omega mu both on the left hand side and the right hand side so we remain rename lambda to be mu and mu to be lambda so mu becomes lambda and lambda becomes mu and similarly the same thing happens here on the Riemann tensor so when we equate the two sides of the equation we can uh, uh, take away omega mu because this is true for any one form field omega so it is a tensor equation and we obtain that the change in v is given by this expression there now remember that the Riemann tensor is such that it is anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of uh, rho and knee so look what we have here we have r acting on the vector delta t t and delta s s in an anti-symmetric way so this is something that is proportional to the area element of that surface that carries those two indices of course rho and knee because it depends on the choice of the vectors t and s so the change of v is r acting on the area element and on the vector v there and we can loosely say that the change of a vector along in uh, along uh, uh, infinitesimal closed curve is something that is proportional to the curvature times the area uh, enclosed by uh, any surface that uh, uh, has as a boundary that uh, curve now the other phenomenon that is a result of curvature is geodesic deviation so let's study this phenomenon in a more quantitative way let's consider a one parameter family of uh, geodesics so we have geodesics here that are curves of uh, an affine parameter t and they are labeled by a real number s so since we will uh, write down a local equation we only need to consider a small region that is small enough so that uh, geodesics never cross and this way we can assume that the parameters s and t are chosen so, th so that they describe a two-dimensional surface with coordinates s and t so in this coordinate system the coordinate vector in the t direction uh, is the tangent vector field to all geodesics therefore it parallel transports itself along them and uh, the other vector field is the so-called deviation vector it points to a neighboring geodesic close enough of course in an infinitesimal way so that uh, uh, a point here that has parameter t is pointed by s to a point in a neighboring ge geodesic that has the same uh, affine parameter t so if you want to have a, uh, a space-time picture of this construction imagine uh, uh, particles moving on uh, time-like uh, geodesics free particles and uh, the affine parameter t is nothing but the proper time of the observers that uh, fly together with uh, those particles so uh, the vectors s are vectors that connect to such observers uh, traveling with the particles and when two such observers are connected with uh, such a vector then their clocks are synchronized and uh, record the same proper time for each one of them uh, furthermore since we have assumed that S and T form a coordinate system the uh, vector fields s and t commute therefore 
the satisfy this equation here. <coughs> now, the first observation is that uh, if we compute the rate of change of the deviation vectors, which is nothing but the direction derivative of s in the, dire uh, in the direction of t, then because of this uh, property that comes from uh, the commuting uh, of the two uh, vector fields here, uh, this rate of change is proportional to s. And uh, you see this is because uh, Tds, that is uh, the derivative here, can be substituted with s dt from this equation. And now this acts linear, linearly on s. So if we rename this d nu t mu as b mu nu, then you see this is nothing but a linear transformation acting on s. So this rate of change is a linear transformation of s. And uh, what, uh, as we know, the covariant uh, derivative along a vector field describes the change of the vector which we differentiate with respect to what it would have been if it were parallel transported along that curve. And uh, this derivative expresses uh, the failure of S to be parallel transported along uh, the geodesics. So uh, since S uh, connects two observers with uh, uh, the same proper time, that uh, simply tells us that uh, uh, S will be changing and these observers will fail to be parallel if they start moving parallel to each other in the beginning, because S will change. Let's make uh, two more useful definitions. As we said, S is nothing but the separation vector of two neighboring observers that, uh, in the case of timeline geodesics, are just moving, falling freely, and uh, their clocks show the same proper time. So if those two observers look at each other, then uh, the change of the separation vector describes how much they move rel relative to each other. So the rate of change of s will simply uh, be their relative velocity. So we define the covariant derivative of s in the direction of t to be the relative, de the relative velocity of two such observers. And in a similar way, we can define the, the relative acceleration, which is nothing but the rate of change of that relative velocity. So this is given by this expression there. So we will now derive an equation for this relative acceleration. And this is important because this is what local observers perceive as uh, gravity. So th th those observers fall freely. They look at each other and uh, they notice that although they are free, they accelerate with respect to each other. So that acceleration is attributed to gravity. And now we will see explicitly the geometric origin of that uh, uh, relative acceleration. So here we just use the definition of the relative acceleration and we substitute uh, the definition of v mu here. So this is the definition of v mu, and it is substituted in here. Now, we use the fact that t and s commute. So t ds is equal to s dt. So t ds here <coughs> is replaced by s dt using equation 1. Now, we apply the Leibniz rule for this product here. So D acts first on S, and then D acts on D, T. So we have here second derivative of T. Now, for the first term, we use equation 1 again. 
and we replace T dS by S dT, and we obtain the first term here. And the second term here, we want to insert the uh, Riemann curvature tensor. In order to do that, we take uh, the order of indices rho and sigma here, and we reverse it. And in that process, we have to add the effect of the uh, Riemann curvature tensor. Now let's focus on this term. This term here is this term here is T S uh, D D T. So let's factor out S and focus on the term T D D T. Now this can be written by applying the Leibniz rule of derivatives as the derivative of the product minus the derivative acting on the other term. So uh, here we have t dt, here we have dt dt here. The reason why we did this is twofold. First of all, this term here vanishes because of our construction. These curves are geodesics, t is their tangent vector which is parallel transported, therefore by the geodesic equation this thing here vanishes. So this term is out. Then the other term here cancels with this term and uh, we can see that by doing a little bit of uh, index renaming. Therefore we are left only with this term that is proportional to the uh, Riemann curvature tensor. So what we have derived is that uh, the relative acceleration of those freely falling observables is given by R T T S according to this expression. That is the geodesic deviation equation and shows that the relative acceleration is proportional to uh, the curvature here. As you see here, we have that is proportional to R. Now, let's look back to the symmetries of the Riemann tensor and do a exercise, an algebraic exercise, and prove them. So, the first symmetry of the Riemann tensor has to do with its last two indices. Now, we have proved that in many ways. We don't need to prove it again. Uh, just mention that uh, we can uh, also write it this way here that states that the symmetric part of uh, the last two indices of the Riemann tensor is equal to zero. The property here is valid for any connection. Now the second property as we have already mentioned before is valid when uh, the connection is torsion free and states that the anti-symmetric part of the last three indices is equal to zero. And this is translated to this equation here. To prove this, it is convenient to go to an inertial frame. Now we will use our requirement that uh, the connection is torsion free. And that means that uh, at an inertial frame, uh, at the point where it is defined, the Christopher symbols vanish. Then the uh, Riemann tensor can be written only in terms of the d gamma terms. <coughs> so we write those three terms of that equation here, put the indices correctly on the right hand side, and notice that uh, they all cancel out giving us zero. Now, the fact that the tensor is zero at uh, one coordinate system means that it is zero at any other coordinate system. So this uh, uh, property is true independent of the choice of coordinates. Now, let's move on to Christopher connections that are both metric compatible and torsion free. Then, uh, 
when we lower the first index of the Riemann tensor, we have the symmetry, which is an anti-symmetry with uh, respect to the first two indices. In order to prove this, we use the fact that uh, uh, the connection is uh, compatible with the metric, therefore it leaves invariant G, so this equation here is an identity. But this is nothing but the uh, commutator of the two derivatives on a 0 2 form. So we obtain uh, those two terms here, each one acting on uh, uh, the index rho and sigma in succession. But you see that each term has the effect of lowering the index lambda and we, uh, this results to the identity that uh, we want to prove. Then we have the symmetry with respect to the exchange of the two pairs of indices, like shown here. Now for that we will use the, the fact that uh, uh, R is an uh, anti-symmetric part here is equal to zero, something that we have already proven. We expand this relation here for uh, R with uh, the row index uh, uh, lowered. And then uh, we write the same identity but for the indices is written in this order here, and we obtain this equation here. Then we add those two equations, and notice that there are uh, these cancellations stemming from the anti-symmetry with respect to the exchange of the first two indices. So we are left with those four terms here, one, two, three, four terms. And then we repeat the same uh, procedure with the indices written in this order. We again obtain two similar equations like that, which we add together. <coughs> Notice that those two terms cancel, and we are again left with those four terms here. And finally, we add those two terms together. <coughs> so many cancellations occur. First of all, this term cancels this term by exchanging the first two indices. So those two terms differ by a minus sign and cancel. Similarly, this term and that term cancel because they are anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of the first two indices. Then we notice that this term and that term are the same by exchanging those two indices here. So each change here brings a minus sign, minus times minus gives a plus, so this term and that term are the same. And similarly for this term and that term, we change mi sigma and do it sigma mi, that's a minus sign, rho ni becomes ni rho, that's another minus sign, that's a plus sign. So we are left with those two terms which have rho ni sigma mi, sigma mi ni rho. Finally, we exchange the order of those two indices, obtaining a minus sign here, and that is nothing but the uh, symmetry property that we claim to be true. Now, this property is a straightforward uh, consequence of uh, the property that we started with, that uh, the anti-symmetric part of rho with respect to the last three indices is zero, and we can write the uh, anti-symmetric part of all four indices uh, this way, and each term here is zero uh, by the already proven symmetry of the Riemann tensor. Now, let's look now at the Bianchi identity. The Bianchi identity is 
this one here tells us that the anti-symmetric part of this expression with respect to the first three indices is zero. That gives us an equation here with three terms where the indices lambda rho sigma are written in a cyclic way. Mi and Ni stay at the same place. Then we have lambda rho sigma, lambda rho sigma, lambda rho sigma. Now, as we will see, this identity is related to the Jacobi identity that uh, uh, we can write down for the derivative operator. So for the Jacobi identity, we write those three uh, commutators, where each commutator has the commutator of the commutator with the derivative. And uh, uh, we write three terms with the uh, indices mi, ni, and sigma written in a uh, permuted in a, a positively cyclic way. So we have mi, ni, sigma, mi, ni, sigma, mi, ni, sigma. Then if we expand this expression in a straightforward way, just write down the commutators here, nothing else, we arrive at this expression. And similarly for the second and the third term. Now, messy as, messy, <coughs> messy as it looks, however, uh, all terms cancel out. And you can see these cancellations explicitly here. Uh, and the result is equal to zero. That is Jacobi identity. So, <coughs> let's see. Uh, let's compute each term here in the Jacobi identity acting on a vector. So we take the first one that has mi, ni, sigma indices acting on the row. So this is the commutator uh, d minus d the commutator. So this is the commutator acting on a 1-1 one, one, uh, tensor field. So we have two terms. The first one has to do with the lower index, with a minus sign. And the second one has to do with the upstairs index, comes with a plus sign. Now, mi and ni are the indices in the commutator. So the indices are found here at the last part, the last slots of the Riemann tensor. And uh, for the second term, we have the commutator acting on V. That is only one index. We have only one term here. But uh, for the second term, we have the derivative acting <coughs> on the product uh, R times V. So we have a Leibniz rule, D acting on R times V minus R D acting on V. And we see that this term and that term cancel each other, leaving us with only those two terms. <coughs> so this is the result for this commutator. And we do the same thing by cyclically uh, moving around the indices mi, ni, sigma. So mi, ni, sigma, mi, ni, sigma on the right hand side. And similarly, wherever we have mini sigma, mini sigma, uh, mini sigma, wherever we find those indices, we move them cyclically around in a positive way. Now, we add those three terms. The left hand side is uh, identically equal to zero because of the Jacobi identity. But uh, we also notice that the first terms on each of the, those three equations also add up to zero because of the, this symmetry of the Riemann tensor. You see that the, the indices here are moved uh, cyclically, so when we add all these three together, that will give us a zero. Now, this is what uh, remains, the uh, sum of those three terms, 
v lambda is taken uh, as a common factor here and this is equal to zero so this term is equal to zero we play a little bit with the symmetries of the Riemann tensor to write the indices in a more convenient uh, way so here we move the pairs around mini comes here rho lambda comes there and similarly for the other terms and then we notice that the first three indices are uh, moved in those two terms in a positively cyclic way which gives us finally the uh, Bianchi identity so let's use those symmetries to count the independent components of the Riemann tensor the first property that uh, we are going to use is that for of course a Christoffel connection uh, the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric uh, both for the pair of the first two indices and the pair of the last two indices so each index here takes n values so if you think of this as a large matrix here the number of uh, elements that it has is the number uh, of values that each separate index takes uh, square but because mini are uh, anti-symmetric uh, we have n times n minus 1 divided by 2 possible values for the first pair and similarly for the second so in the end this uh, large matrix here has n times n minus 1 2 to the square uh, elements now we will use the other symmetry of the Riemann tensor which states that uh, its anti-symmetric part with respect to the last uh, three indices there is equal to zero so how many equations do we have the first index here takes n values and then the last three indices uh, take n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 divided by 3 factorial independent values so we have uh, a total of n times this independent conditions which is n squared times n minus 1 n minus 2 divided by 6 so if we take the number of components that we found from the first property and subtract the number of constraints that they have to satisfy then we end up with n square times n square minus 1 divided by 12 independent components and since you can see that the other symmetries are not independent but are derived from those two symmetries there then there are no extra conditions to impose for obtaining independent components and this is the final result and uh, the Riemann tensor has n squared times n squared minus 1 divided by 12 independent components <laughs>